It's been amazing. Really beautiful location and perfect weather outside. Exactly. We meet lots of great people. We're rounding off all five cars out there. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time for us, Frosty. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to be here. I look forward to reading your wonderful magazine and seeing uh, the article. Thank you. Yes. Um, how have you been these days? How have I been? Uh, everything's fine. Yeah, you know it's great to be here, uh, having this wonderful weather, and the film festival is amazing. Exactly. Um, and that's that's what we've been doing this this last week, and um, the film was in. Uh, Fort Lauderdale Film Festival, so uh, it's been pretty active. Mm -hmm. So, what did you think when Chris Stearns approached you with the idea for the documentary about your life and about your art? Yes. Well, Chris Stearns um, was one of the directors, and he actually, uh, my wife, this is her idea. She started a short film, and then uh, when when the director saw it, mm -hmm. uh, he. He said, well, this is a much better, um, bigger film than what, what we started. You know, we were just going to do a, a film. My wife was going to do a film on us moving from Brooklyn and moving into our new museum in Pennsylvania. And and when he saw the footage, he said, no, no, we, we need to do a bigger movie. So the thing just kept expanding. And then, you know, Debbie became the producer and, and, um, and uh, that it, it went on from there. You know, and it took it took uh, almost four years to make this movie. Wow, that's um, awesome! Uh, it, it was a lot more than than we ever thought because we we were not movie makers. Mm -hmm. If you could separate your life from your art, would you want to even give it a try? No, no, it doesn't work like that. Without my art, my life doesn't mean anything. I mean, seriously. Uh, this might be a hard question for you. Do you have any specific favorite piece of yours? Yeah, it, your, your, your sculpture ends up being like your children. You know, they're all <laughs> over the place. They're in different uh, periods of disrepair and, and, uh, and glory, and their settings are all different. But you get attached. You get attached to different ones in different ways. Usually, the piece that you like the best is the one you just finished, and it usually goes like that. I don't know why. Uh, maybe because you know the past is is um, in the past, and you're what what you, what the sculptor's trying to do is make the future visible. Mm -hmm. And I do that with a lot of different materials, but. Mostly metal. I'm a, what you would call, if I had to say, what do I do? I'm a metal sculptor. I push metal around. I turn metal, mm -hmm. which is inanimate, into something that's more ephemeral. I, I turn like matter into spirit. That's what I'm trying to do. It's a bit of conjuring, you know? And y you don't necessarily think that while you're doing it. But then when you step back and look at it, mm -hmm. uh, you see that there's something bigger than you. It's, something, it's, not, it's not spiritual in any kind of normal sense, but there's something bigger than you that's giving you some information, and that's maybe genetic. You know, art, a lot of it is um, intuitive. You're just doing it, and it's one thing leads to another, and... Pretty soon you've got something, and the interest is where'd that come from? But is there any specific reason be reason behind why you choose metal as a medium for your art? Oh, I think in my case it, it, it seemed sort of natural because when I was growing up like a teenager or in high school in, in Long Beach, California, that was the hot rod capital of the world, and still is. So. We had cars. We would go and, and look at look at these beautiful cars, and those are metal sculptures. There's metal all pushed around in different shapes. The painting on the cars were art. We didn't have 
there might have been artists in L.A., of course there were, but we didn't know about them, you know. We had Big Daddy Ed Roth and the Rat Fink, and, and we were looking at cars. And then that just, when I got to art school, that just morphed into uh, making metal sculpture. Make, you know, it was more abstract than that cars are, are limited in, in their figurative zone, where when you become an abstract artist, you can do anything you want. And that freedom is what I was really after. I didn't want a regular job. I had had a bunch of jobs, and um, I didn't want to do that. You want to create something of your own. Yeah, it was just the best job in the world. I mean, when you become an artist, you get to do what you want. It's not like you can do anything you want, but you can in your studio, you know. And it's hard. I mean, it, it's... Uh, it's hard maintaining the real world stuff for an artist because he wants to be in the studio working and um, when you're not, you're agitated. Let's talk about your most talked piece. Will you tell us more about Moon Museum? Oh yeah. Um, going to the moon um, in 1969 was the most exciting thing of my generation. It's hard to express to, to the young people like yourself that how important this was. This was, um, it was evolution that you could see. In other words, like the salamander coming up out of the, the soup onto the land, that was evolution. And this, you know, billion years later, we get off, this man gets off of this planet, goes to another celestial body, that's evolution. But the weird thing is you could watch it and you could watch it on television. Um, so that, that was exciting. So all the artists wanted to have some involvement with that and a lot of them did. There's a lot of paintings and prints and photographs uh, commemorating that spirit. So my idea was to get five artist friends and myself and uh, make a little chip that would be placed on the lunar lander that would go to the moon, and that's called the Moon Museum. That was uh, printed at Bell Labs, who were working on computer chips. So they did it as if they were making a computer chip, but they had five drawings, and six drawings, and they shrank them down onto this little chip that's three quarters of an inch by half an inch, and it was uh, put onto the foot of the lunar lander. So it's there now, and it's called the Moon Museum. Wow, that's and since great. this is the 50th anniversary, we're getting a lot of play for the Moon Museum. There's been 50 years where nobody was really interested. But now, you know, it's a big story um, uh, going, uh, going to the moon. And, and you'll see more of that as that anniversary approaches. Uh, it'll become a big topic. Um, let's talk about the documentary itself. Is there anything that was filmed for the documentary, the editor cut, that you wish had stayed in? Yes, the best film, the best part of the film is on the floor, the cutting room floor. But I am not the editor, so I don't get to say what goes in and what goes out. And, um, and I'm not an actor, so it, it, it's, it's a, all a new experience to me. And the making of the film, which my wife did, was I, I got to see how this is done by watching her. It's just like an amazing process. It's much more in depth and complicated than anybody knows, you know, except if you have ever worked on a, on a you know, an hour and a half film. Mm -hmm. But it's exciting, you know, it's the story of my life in pictures, so. Do you think arts help bringing communities together and especially creating dialogue? Oh, gee. You know, I really don't. But having said that, I go to, you know, art is a separate thing. It doesn't, it doesn't even want to mix, but it does. You know, art, art, art is a way of transferring and, and um, communicating joy. So, but going to the film festival, all those films are art and they're all done by artists. So you go there and the whole community is together I can't imagine something that would bring the community together more 
than this film festival. You know, the night of lights is nice and people are coming in there walking through, but they're not really together. You go into one of these films, an audience is an audience. They all clap together. They're all there to see the same thing. So, yeah, um, I think movies bring people together maybe maybe more than, than the, the fine arts. What's next for Frosty Myers? Um, oh, gee. Every winter I come here and work on a project so when I get back in the summertime into my studio in Pennsylvania uh, I'll have a project to do and right now I'm working on uh, I'm working on redoing a project that uh, got lost after the Pepsi-Cola pavilion in Expo 70 which I designed um, there was a sun track sculpture that actually tracked the sun and by way of mirrors would put this put the put the sun's rays into a fog cloud that surrounded the pavilion and that was something that that I thought was ahead of its time and so I'm I'm thinking of redoing that now that there's so much solar going on you know I was the first artist to to use this as an artwork and it got lost, so I'm thinking of, of redoing that. And um, so that's one of the projects I'm working on now. I just finished uh, a big piece, which I worked on here last winter, and that was called The Critic's Prison. Um, and it's a eight-foot jail cell that, with a table and a chair and a pencil and a piece of paper, and the critic goes in, and when they write you a stunning review, you let them out. Um, that's, that's great. Uh, so before we wrap up, is there anything that you'd like to share or any words of inspiration for our next generation of artists? First of all, you have to want to do it. But if you want to do it, that's what you should do. Um, uh, it's, it's the greatest thing a man or woman can do. It's man or woman at their best being an artist and that's any kind of artist and uh, it's exciting you learn about yourself art is a mirror you learn about yourself while you're working on this stuff it it's how good are you you know are you any good and that's why you want to make the, the piece as good as you can and it's an, an explore uh, exploration you're exploring an artist is an explorer what they're doing is they're building the future and handing it to you. And you go, oh, I never saw that before. And uh, sculpture, uh, sculptors make shapes a lot of the time. They bring a shape that you've never seen before or, or uh, different shapes put together in a way that's sometimes astounding, you know? So that's the excitement, you know, when you actually, uh, something happens in the studio yeah, I'd like to introduce my wife, uh, Deborah Myers, who's the producer of the movie. Um, this is really her movie, and like she says, I'm just the, the subject. Um, uh, so, here's my lovely wife, Deborah. Hello, Deborah. How have you been? I'm fine, and you? Uh, good, good. Um, so, uh, the first question I want to ask you, as wife of Frosty. Do you, what's, what's the best piece of art that he has done for you? Not for in you, my but yeah, in your opinion. Oh, golly. Yeah. I don't know what's so great about Frosty is his work is always evolving. He never got stuck in a category. So within his different um, bodies of work, I have certain pieces that I like, maybe more than others. Some of them are, were, I think, sculpture that crossed over into his furniture. You know, for 10, 20 years, he did very abstracted um, furniture design that was part of a big movement in the 80s in New York City. So there were certain pieces. One in particular is Sail Away. I call that a crossover because if you looked at it, it would totally be a sculpture. But once a person gets into that sculpture and it starts walk, rocking uh, in two different ways, um, you see that it has functionality um, 
in furniture. I guess that's one of my favorite pieces. Um, let's talk about the movie. Okay. Um, so as he mentioned, he's just the subject of the movie, and yes. you are the one who, <laughs> who have like uh, drove to this. What what inspired you to do this movie? Um, well, we were, you know, we lived in New York for 40, 50 years, and particularly a place in Brooklyn, uh, an old meatpacking building, in, um, and we pioneered Williamsburg, Brooklyn, which became a very good place to be. And after 30 years. Uh, we were leaving that because we needed a bigger change and we'd also been working for 30 years on our sculpture garden up on the headwaters of the Delaware River. Uh, I was trained as a landscape designer uh, after a couple of other different careers. Every 12 years I move on to something else. And um, so I wanted to document this building, our life there, and the building of the new building. So I approached um, two people as director, editor, um, cinematographer, uh, to do this 20-minute project. And as Frosty said, as we started talking and looking through archival images, uh, the directors were totally flipped out because it's basically the story of art and music and culture and the social changes. It started in the very late 50s and then, of course, New York in the 60s and 70s was, was the place to be, right? 80s moved to Brooklyn. So it that seems to be the real uh, thread through the story. And um, his artwork, which evolved over that half century, and the people and the artists and musicians uh, that he um, interacted with uh, socially, um, made the story expand and you know as frosty said at a certain point some of the best stuff is on the cutting room floor we probably could do a mini series but you know this was all um i was executive producer this was all financed out of pocket uh, we only had one camera person we only had one take in most instances there was no hair no makeup uh, no sound person um, You know, so it's the best home movie about an artist ever made. And I think in terms of artists, usually if you see movies about artists, they're showing how they paint and what color of blue goes next to yellow and you hear the art speak that most people aren't interested in, but when you hear about Max's Kansas City and rock and roll and David Bowie and Janis Joplin and the woman's movement and the gay liberation and uh, you know it just was an amazing time to be there. I, I came later in the early to mid 70s as a dancer um, from FSU basically and then moved to New York and we met a year after I was there. So I was in another art form, but they were all intertwined at that point. The barriers were broken down. So. Uh, your your uh, Frosty's artwork and uh, the movie that's based on his life, uh, what type of message will it give out to the youngsters or the younger generation? You know, it's interesting. I've had friends, children see this movie. And one, for example, is a musician trying to make it in Austin. This was such an inspiration to him because, you know, there's a certain point where you put in 10 years and you think, I'm not making it. I have to come up with another life plan, but through this movie you will see the highs and the lows and then don't give up and stay true to your vision and if you have to uh, make sacrifices and work uh, a job in a metal factory or a landscape business or um, you'll see in the movie our collaboration in terms of sculpture and my landscape design. It's basically, you know, um, I think John Lennon said it, life is what happens when you're busy doing other things. And this is the life of an artist. It's not the art world as we've marked it, that we know of it today. It's not based on who is selling at the million dollar range. These artists of this time, and dancers, I mean, danced as a showgirl making 250 bucks a week to support us for many for a year and that was like good money in those days but you just sort of evolve and Frosty and I have been very lucky we met early and fell in love and uh, 
it's been a long, long life together. There's ups and downs, and you pitch in and, and make a life out of it. And I think that's what maybe for younger people seeing this film, um, they may hopefully take that inspiration away because ultimately I think that is one of the themes that the director Chris Stearns and I, you know, as you're trying, this was not done with a storyboard. We didn't start out with here, we're gonna do this, 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 and this. And as the editing came about, which you know if you're editors or working on films, an editor can change the entire story. And so we tried to then go back and think with through the editing, what is the theme of the movie and what do we want to give to people? And uh, I think Chris Stern um, did a wonderful job. It was started earlier with another director um, Tim Lalamia, who uh, started this project and, um, you know, did a lot of, you'll see we have, there's drone footage, there's time lapse, so anyhow, I hope you enjoy it. Yep. Uh, finally, I just want to ask you, as a producer, what is the best feedback that you have received as a compliment, and what is the criticism that you have received? For the movie, for the film? Uh, the criticism is it's too long. Everybody, then I have other people that say, no, I was riveted to it and I stayed and watched it twice. So that seems to be, and we've gone back, um, Frosty, myself, the director, the editor, and we also had a great um, sound engineer and uh, composer who wrote original sound score for this movie another friend, another artist. So there was also in, in this film, there was a community of artists, like in the old sense, we all got together to make this thing happen. And um, I think, and, and I guess the most positive thing I had, which is what I said, my friend's son, that this was an inspiration for him as a musician to, to keep going. So that was the inspiration. And also a lot of artist friends, and artists are not generous with other artists. A lot of them come to me and say, this is the best film we've ever seen on an artist's life. It's so true um, to what the issues and the struggles are, whether you're a writer, musician, painter, sculptor, um, landscape designer. Um, any messages that you want to um, give out to our viewers before we wrap up? Um, no, just uh, follow your dream. Don't give up. Help other people. up a beautiful day in St. Augustine, Florida. I'd like to take the time to thank our special guest and the St. Augustine Film Festival for having us. Um, we hope to see all of you next year in St. Augustine Film Festival. Please visit our website www.beunique.org. Thank you for watching us. It's me, Anita. Chantel. Bye-bye.